Hi guys, so we're gonna do cell respiration today. So here's your photosynthesis page from a few days ago. Essentially cellular respiration is now gonna take this glucose and it's gonna break it down to release its energy. So we're essentially gonna run this reaction in reverse. So we'll have a exergonic reaction and then all the free energy that is released by this glucose is going to be used to power endergonic reactions, specifically the creation of ATP. So we're gonna kind of do a lot of these processes again. We're gonna have an electron transport chain. Um, this process right here, using ATP synthase to phosphorylate ATP, that's known as chemiosmosis. So like you're gonna see a lot of similar processes in cell respiration. We're just gonna be going uh, backwards instead of forwards like we did for photosynthesis. So I'm actually going to flip a couple pages just because I don't want stuff to bleed through. But same thing, we're going to use two pages again. So over here on the left, let's title that Cellular Respiration. Okay. And so um, essentially respiration, like just the word respiration, means an input of oxygen and output of carbon dioxide. So that's what we're going to be doing at the cellular level. Um, so there's multiple types of cellular respiration. Typically when someone just says the word cellular respiration, they're going to be talking about aerobic respiration. Uh, which is cellular respiration in the presence of oxygen. Okay. Um, kind of once we go over aerobic cellular respiration, I'll go over, there's two other types of respiration or metabolism methods. So there's anaerobic respiration. Which some organisms utilize who live in um, environments that are have really low amounts of oxygen um, or are lacking oxygen altogether. And then there's a it's not a different type of respiration, it's just another method of metabolism called fermentation. Um, but fermentation is kind of a secondary process that can be paired with one of these, um, or it could be an organism's sole method of metabolism. But essentially cellular respiration is where we take an organic molecule, someone's playing their music so loud. Uh, so the organic molecule is typically glucose, but because glucose and carbohydrates are just made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, it's actually possible that proteins, lipids can also be used in cellular respiration. They usually enter the process at a different step, so a different stage of cellular respiration, um, or we can take a lipid and we can kind of like break it down and rebuild it into glucose if there isn't a an input of glucose from food that we're eating. So respiration is when organic molecules are sequentially broken down. And we're gonna break them down step by step to release their energy um, that's stored in high energy electrons. We're gonna release those high energy electrons almost like a pair at a time. If you released all the energy stored in a glucose molecule all at once, it would actually combust. And so it would actually cause, uh, it would release so much thermal energy that it would ignite. And so we would blow up. Um, so we break it down sequentially so that your cells don't heat up too much and then you're just kind of like releasing that energy stored um, over time step by step. So organic molecules are sequentially broken down uh, to release energy. Wonderful. Uh, so your chemical equation is essentially the reverse reaction of photosynthesis. So we're going to start with a molecule of glucose. Uh, in the presence of oxygen, so we're going to be doing aerobic respiration, will yield water and carbon dioxide. Okay. 
So when we look at these products and where they originate, this pro or sorry, these reactants, this glucose. Uh, so if these are heterotrophs, that means they're consuming this glucose. So this came from plants that we ate or from other uh, omnivores or carnivores that we ate. So if you think of like a cow, if I eat beef, I'm getting glucose and macromolecules from that beef, but where did that cow get its macromolecules from in the first place? It got it from plants. And how did plants make it in the first place? They did photosynthesis. So essentially all the macromolecules that we're consuming, the energy stored in those macromolecules came from sun light energy. So now we're going to essentially take that light energy that was converted to chemical energy and we're going to now transfer it from glucose to ATP. So we consume glucose um, or if it's a plant then they created the glucose for themselves because they're autotrophs. The oxygen is something we inhale so it's atmospheric. Um, if it's an organism that lives uh, aquatically, then there's dissolved oxygen in the water. So it can like run across their gills um, or the oxygen can diffuse into these organisms. Water, so our two products are actually both waste products. These are the two things that we exhale. So we're gonna exhale carbon dioxide as a gas. And then we uh, exhale water also as a gas. So this is water vapor that's getting exhaled. That's why when it's really cold out, the water that you're exhaling condenses so you can see your breath because the water's condensing to form almost like a little cloud right outside your mouth. So this reaction is exergonic. So it has a net release of energy. So we'll say this is like that delta G that's released, that free energy. It's a negative delta G because we're an exergonic reaction. You can see that we've increased entropy. We went from a highly organized molecule to many unorganized disorderly molecules. So this is the energy difference between our reactants and our products. The second reaction that's going to occur is we're gonna take the reactants, adenosine diphosphate with inorganic phosphate and we're gonna create many ATP molecules. So how much energy is released from this exergonic reaction can determine how many ATPs we can create. Um, I think to create one ATP, it's about 7.3 uh, joules of energy. So however much energy is released from this glucose, you would divide that by 7.3 and that will give you our yield for ATP. So this was an exergonic reaction, and now we're gonna take that energy and add it into, so this will be our adding into our endergonic reaction. So photosynthesis transformed light energy into glucose, so chemical energy. Cell respiration is transferring chemical energy from glucose into chemical energy as ATP simply because ATP is our usable form of energy. It can bind to multiple proteins, whereas glucose cannot. And it's a simpler, smaller molecule, so you'll harness smaller amounts of energy at a time versus a lot of energy at a time, which can lead to combustion. So there are three steps to cell respiration versus uh, photosynthesis had two. So the first step is called glycolysis. The second step is called the Krebs cycle. Named after, like the Calvin cycle, named after the man who uh, defined the steps. The Krebs cycle is also known as, so AKA also known as the citric acid cycle. Because it starts with citric acid. Um, and then that's also abbreviated as the TCA cycle. So many names, all synonymous, all for the Krebs cycle. The third step is called oxidative phosphorylation, and it actually involves two steps within it, and we'll kind of flush those out. Wonderful. All right, so 
Let's go to our next page. Turn your hand, uh, your notebook landscape, and we're gonna start drawing cellular respiration. So, like we did for photosynthesis, let's just draw a mitochondria close up because cellular respiration occurs in the mitochondria. So, a single mitochondrion it has a double membrane. So, here's its outer membrane it has a low surface area, and then its inner membrane is highly folded. So we have two membranes, inner membrane and an outer membrane. The inner membrane is highly folded to increase the surface area, okay? So this is just our outer membrane. Use the outer mem. Uh, this is our inner membrane. Wonderful. And then now we have these spaces. So just like the chloroplast, how the membranes were dividing and compartmentalizing different processes, the same is true for cellular respiration. So you're gonna have some parts of cellular resp respiration that occur like across a membrane, other parts will only occur here, other parts will only occur here in that space. So we're kind of organizing our steps so that they're more efficient. Um, so the space inside the inner membrane, so all of this space here is called the matrix. That's where Keanu Reeves is. <laughs> uh, and then the space between the membranes is called the intermembrane space. Makes sense between the membranes. Um, and then the last structure, these folds are very um, important because there's a very specific part of cellular respiration that occurs directly on those folds. So this infolding of inner membrane is called a criste. This would be another name for my child if I have a child, Christe, and I'd spell it like that so she'd be embarrassed for her whole life. Uh, so that's the fold. So we have like many Christes here, and then that's where another step of cell respiration occurs. Okay, let's pull a little box. Yeah, and then we're going to draw a giant mitochondria on our page, okay? Um, I'm going to draw it in a really specific way because we have to draw inside the mitochondria just like we did for the chloroplast but kind of keep in mind when we talked about the chloroplast none of this was cytoplasm we were looking at a granum and then you could either be like inside the thylakoid or outside the thylakoid versus here you're either going to be in the mitochondria or outside the mitochondria so some steps are going to occur in the cytoplasm so i'm going to draw my mitochondria Maybe let me draw mine before you draw yours, just so you don't mess up, okay? Um, so we're gonna start with uh, the outer membrane. I'm gonna just do a piece of it since our little box kind of gets in the way. Oh yeah, that is terrible. And then we're gonna draw our inner membrane and we're gonna draw a few folds, like a few criste, but not too many, just because we need a lot of space uh, to draw in here. Once we get to kind of this side of the inner membrane, I'm actually going to widen my inner membrane space just because we need to draw inside of it. So um, keep in mind, this is not what it really looks like, but we're gonna kind of widen that space so I have all this space in here to draw. So we have outer membrane, inner membrane, matrix, inner membrane space, Chris Dang. Cool. So everything outside of this mitochondria, all of this is cytoplasm. So let's label that. Cytoplasm. So some steps of cell respiration occur outside of the mitochondria, and then uh, the high energy yielding portions occur within the mitochondria. So our first step is called glycolysis. If you look at the word glycolysis, its um, process is literally in its name. So we have glyco, and we have lysis, okay? So glyco is referring to our glucose molecule or carbohydrate, and then lysis means to split. Remember when cells lyse, they pop or they split open. So in glycolysis, we are literally going to take our glucose molecule, C6H12O6, and we're going to split it. So let's start with a glucose molecule. What colors do I want to use? 
this one. All right, so we're gonna start with glucose. Glycolysis is a really simple uh, process. We're gonna draw it very simply. It takes like 15 different catalyzed steps. We're gonna show it in one step. Okay, so you take glucose and that glucose gets converted to this molecule called pyruvate. Once again, it takes like 15 different enzymes. There's 15 intermediate molecules to get from here to here. You don't need to know that yet. If you take a biochem course in college, you'll probably learn all 15 steps. Um, but for now, this is essentially what you need to know. Essentially what we're doing, glucose is a six carbon sugar and it's a ring structure, so it's shaped like this. Zoom. So we can count our glucoses, sorry, our carbons, where two lines junction is a carbon. So this is carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, four, five, six. My pen is running out of ink. No pen. All right, so those are our six carbons. Essentially what glycolysis does, let's just kind of keep in track, this is a six carbon sugar. Glycolysis is going to take this six carbon sugar and we're going to split it into two different molecules in a sequential uh, process. So we're essentially going to break these bonds here. So pyruvate, we actually end up with two molecules of pyruvate. So here's one of them. Here's the second one. And each pyruvate molecule has one two, three carbons. One, two, three carbons. Okay. So if you remember, all the bonds in a carbohydrate are covalent. So if I'm going to break covalent bonds and make sure that those molecules don't bond again, I need to remove the uh, electrons that they were sharing with each other. If I remove those shared electrons and transfer them to a different molecule, then the ends of these glucose molecules, those carbons, will not bond up again. So we've broken bonds here. We've grown, gone from a single pretty large molecule to two smaller molecules. This is an exergonic reaction, okay? So let's kind of draw our net energies. It does take energy to break bonds. This is the activation energy. To split glucose, it takes, okay, uh, it takes two ATP. Can you see that? Okay. Two ATP are required to break these two bonds that I've shown here. But because it's an exergonic reaction, there are actually, there's enough free energy released to phosphorylate four ATP molecules. Okay, so two ATP molecules enter to provide the activation energy. Four ATP molecules or energy for four ATP molecules was released due to the exergonic uh, reaction. And so net for glycolysis we yield two ATP, okay? It's like you get $4, but you had to spend $2 to get the four. We got four ATP, but we had to spend two ATP to run the reaction. So net, we earned two ATP molecules, okay? And that's glycolysis. So easy. <laughs> All right, let's kind of organize this down here. Uh, so this, we just showed glycolysis. Cool. So we now have two molecules of pyruvate. Each of these molecules are now going to carry on through the rest of cell respiration. Uh, the other molecules that we've created, so we've created these high energy molecules, but then we also have to talk about these electrons. So just like we had in photosynthesis, where we had all these redox reactions, where we had uh, molecules that were gaining electrons, other molecules were losing electrons, and we had these electron shuttles. It's the same thing for cell respiration. They're just different electron shuttles. So let's talk about those down here, okay? So the two electron shuttles that we're going to use for cell respiration electron shuttles. So if you remember for photosynthesis, we used NADP plus. Uh, for uh, cellular respiration, we're going to use NAD plus. 
right? Um, if that molecule gets reduced, it gains electrons, it'll become NADH, and those electrons that it's shuttling are being shared right there between the hydrogen and the oxygen. So a covalent bond will be formed right there. So it's shuttling electrons. The other electron shuttle that we're going to use is called FADH. And when it shuttles electrons, it's called FADH2. And the shared electrons are between those two FADHs. Uh, so it would look like this. So we'd have FADH, and then those shared electrons would be bonding with that free hydrogen ion. Okay, so we have like oxidized forms where they don't have the shared electrons and then we have the reduced forms where they are storing these shared electrons. And what those electrons are going to do is they're going to be shuttled uh, to a different part of the cell respiration process and we're going to take the energy from those electrons to create more ATP. The whole purpose of cell respiration is to take the energy from this glucose and we want to get it all transferred to ATP molecules. So far we've only generated two ATP molecules with glycolysis, so we're going to generate a lot more. So those electrons that were released from these bonds right here, they're gonna now reduce some electron shuttles. So it's actually gonna be enough electrons because we released two pairs, one pair from here, one pair from here, to take two NAD plus molecules and they will get reduced to two NADH molecules. So now the electrons that were being shared between these bonds are now being stored in these two NADH molecules. Wonderful. Once we have our pyruvates, our pyruvates will actually uh, diffuse into the matrix. So we're going to be moving into here. As they diffuse into the matrix, there's another series of reactions that occur where pyruvate is converted into um, acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoEnzyme A um, is still having a lot of those carbons. So you, we're gonna kinda track the carbons. So we start with six carbons here. We still have six carbons here. You can kinda see like as we break more bonds, we're gonna break all these bonds. We're gonna release those shared electrons. Um, what's eventually gonna happen is we're also gonna be releasing all these carbons. Um, and then those will get exhaled as carbon dioxide. So when pyruvate becomes acetyl-CoA, that's actually a small reaction. We call it the link reaction because it links glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. It's also called pyruvate oxidation. So there's kind of multiple names for this little reaction that kind of links our two cycles. From the link reaction, we actually release some carbon. Each acetyl-CoA only has two carbons. So where we had two, three carbon molecules, two pyruvates, now we have two, two carbon molecules. So we've broken more of these bonds here and here, but what's happened now is we've released our carbon dioxide, or we've released our carbon as carbon dioxide. So, let me find a color we would have from this reaction a release of two carbon dioxides, okay? So like tracking our carbons, we started with six, we had six here, now we have four, right? Two times two, four carbons, and then there's my other two, so six carbons were released as CO2. From this reaction, because we broke more bonds, we now have released two more pairs of electrons to be shared between our NADH, our shuttles. So using the same color that we use over here for our shuttles, this reaction will also take two NAD pluses and reduce those to two NADHs. So now there's two more pairs of shared electrons that are released from glucose, okay? These are high energy electrons, so we're gonna use their high energy later to power um, oxidative phosphorylation.
Okay, the next step of cell respiration is called the Krebs cycle. And it's just like the Calvin cycle, how where you start with is what you end with. So it occurs in the matrix. I'm gonna, just gonna draw it as a little circle. Maybe like go over your criste like that. Okay, this is the Krebs cycle. Once again, you don't need to know all the intermediate steps. As long as you know the reactants for each step, what comes out of each step, you're good. So we have this Krebs cycle. Acetyl-CoA -A will join the Krebs cycle, okay? And then we're going to sequentially break down the rest of the bonds in acetyl-CoA, right? So kind of so far, we've broken down those bonds from glucose. We broke down a couple more bonds from glucose. And now we're going to finally break all the rest of the bonds from glucose. What ends up happening is we're going to release the remainder of our carbons. So the rest of our carbon is going to be released as carbon dioxide from the Krebs cycle. So we're going to release four carbon dioxides. Okay. So the six carbons that entered as glucose have now exited four, five, six as carbon dioxide. Another thing that's going to get released from this is this is an exergonic reaction. So net, we're going to release two molecules of ATP. Found that ATP color. So like so far, if we're keeping track of all the ATP, we have four ATP, right? We got two from glycolysis. Now we have two from the Krebs cycle. And the last thing is now we've released all the rest of the free electrons that were stored between the carbons and hydrogens and the carbons and carbons in our glucose molecule. So going into our shuttles, we actually are going to re release a lot of shuttles or reduce a lot of shuttles. Enough electrons are released to reduce 6NAD plus, and we can also reduce plus. 2FADH molecules. So all of these, how are we going to draw this? It's from the Krebs. So we're just going to draw it going up. All of these are reduced. So they're taking all the rest of the free electrons from breaking down all the bonds left in acetyl CoA. And now we're going to end up with 6NADH molecules and 2FADH2 molecules. Okay, so here's what's happened so far. We have finished breaking down glucose. By the end of the Krebs cycle, all of the electrons that were present in glucose are now found in our six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 uh, and electron shuttles. So all the high energy electrons from glucose are now here. All the carbon and oxygen is now here, released as carbon dioxide. And then we have a small net release of ATP due to the exergonic nature of these reactions. So once we get here, glucose is gone, all of its energy is here. So what we're gonna do now is our last step is gonna harness this energy to create more ATP, more usable energy for our body. So here's what happens. We're going to have an electron transport chain and we're going to have chemiosmosis. So maybe let's just make a note for our Krebs cycle here so we have it all organized. Okay, and then over here for our last chunk of mitochondria, we're gonna be showing oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. What these words are saying is we're going to phosphorylate ATP, right? So we're going to add a phosphate group to ADP to create ATP phosphorylate by oxidizing our electron shuttles. So our electron shuttles are going to lose their electrons and that's going to power the phosphorylation or creation of ATP. There are two parts to oxidative phosphorylation. The first part is the electron transport chain. Also, ooh, I bumped the camera. Oh, siento. Uh, also known as the ETC. And then the second step is called chemiosmosis. OK. 
molecule. So let's draw our electron transport chain. We're gonna draw our protein structures here. We'll draw our ATP synthase as well. So there are three protein complexes per electron transport chain. And then we have our ATP synthase, which is remember shaped like that butternut squash. Okay, so all of these, just like in photosynthesis, are protein pumps. So let's kind of make a note, what are these? These are protein pumps. So because they're pumps, that means they all move ions against their gradient. So they're gonna be moving things from a low concentration to areas of high concentration against their gradient. To do that, they need an input of energy. They're gonna get that energy from our electron shuttles, okay? Um, we have three different ones. Let's kind of set up our hydrogen gradient. So within our matrix, we have a lower concentration of hydrogen or protons. And then in our intermembrane space, we have a higher concentration of hydrogen ions. Okay, so if these pumps are going to pump from low to high, that means we're going to be taking ions away from the matrix and we're going to be placing them into the intermembrane space. So our pHs are going to be changing, right? As we pump more hydrogens into the intermembrane space, this area becomes more acidic, less hydrogen ions here, this area becomes more basic, okay? Um, if there is no cell respiration occurring, so we're not pumping anything, then our hydrogens will just diffuse out of our synthase and then the pH will be the same on both sides until we can activate these pumps again. So all these electron shuttles that we've created, if they're not already in the matrix, they're going to diffuse into the matrix. So like these eight right here, because they were generated by the Krebs cycle in the matrix, they're already in the matrix. These two out here, because they were created in the cytoplasm, these, sorry, four will have to diffuse or transfer their electrons um, into the matrix. So they all kind of come right here to these little protein complexes. So essentially what happens, we go zoom, zoom, is at one at a time, they're going to drop off their electrons. Let's just draw one NADH, and it's going to get oxidized. So this NADH is going to lose its electrons. When it loses its electrons, it returns back to its uh, oxidized form of NAD plus and hydrogen ions, okay? There is an enzyme located on this first protein complex that is able to oxidize NADH. There are no enzymes to power that oxidation on these other two. So we'll bond here first to that enzyme. Those electrons get released here. So the electrons that were right here between NAD and the H are now lost. So NADH is oxidized and this protein complex has been reduced. These N, uh, electrons are high energy. They came from high energy glucose to start with. So we didn't have to like re-energize them with sunlight energy like we do with photosynthesis because they already started with a lot of energy because they were created from that sunlight energy by plants. So what we're going to do is we're just going to use the energy from these electrons to pump or power the movement of hydrogen from low to high. So when the electrons are at this first complex, this first complex is able to move hydrogen into the intermembrane space against its gradient low to high. What happens is this next protein complex is more electronegative than the first, so it pulls the electrons toward it. So now our electrons are here. When my electrons are at this second pump, this pump can now move hydrogen from low to high, right? So you only have one pump working at a time if there's only one NADH, right? So like we started here, the electrons moved, now we're here, but another NADH can now come and have this pump. So they can pump at the same time as long as there's multiple NADHs present. This last protein is uh, the most electronegative, so these electrons will now be moved here. When the electrons are at this protein, it can then pump hydrogen against its gradient. Cool. 
And then we have our final molecule, which is the most electronegative of these three. And that molecule is oxygen. I'm going to draw it in brown. Okay. So if you remember from our overall chemical equation, we have zoom out glucose, right? We've broken that down now. We have oxygen. So we haven't talked about the input of oxygen yet. Uh, we also haven't talked about the output of water, but we have exhaled our carbon dioxide, right? So we've already had glucose come in. Here's our reactant. We've had all of our carbon dioxide come out. There's a product. But now we need to talk about the role of oxygen. Oxygen is known as the final electron acceptor. As you know, oxygen is highly electronegative. That's why it bonds with, um, when it bonds with hydrogen, it makes the polar molecule of water. So the electrons will now be attracted to oxygen. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. So this is where our electrons are going to end up. Oxygen will take those electrons. It'll grab some free hydrogen ions. Let's just draw like a little one here. It'll grab some free hydrogen ions and it'll now make waters. Where's my brown? Right? So this all together, the electrons, you can't see it. The electrons plus these free hydrogens uh, are gonna generate eventually six molecules of water. The electrons between these polar covalent bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen are the electrons that originated from glucose, okay? So the energy we took and we harnessed that energy to pump these hydrogens, the matter, so the atoms left over and the electrons left over, we released as we exhale. So all the electrons from your food, you're releasing as water. What we've done now is we've created a stronger gradient. So where we had lower concentration inside, higher outside, we've now made that gradient even further apart, so we've pumped these out. The only ways for these hydrogens to enter, re-enter the matrix from high to low concentration is through our enzyme. This is the same enzyme in photosynthesis called ATP synthase. And it behaves in the same way. These hydrogens will naturally diffuse out through ATP synthase. That causes a rotation to occur. So the ATP synthase will rotate like our rotor, and then that will produce just enough energy to take ATP, sorry, ADP and an inorganic phosphate and phosphorylate that into ATP. For every single hydrogen ion that moves out, you generate one ATP molecule, approximately. So the more hydrogens that can be pumped utilizing our 12 shuttles, the more ATP can be produced. So if we have this NADH, it can at least pump one hydrogen ion at a time, right? Uh, because the electrons are going to move so quickly to the next. But like at least you're going to get one. And then each of these will generate three ATP molecules. Um, the FADH2s are slightly different simply because the enzyme to oxidize FADH2 is located on our second pump. So if FADH2 approaches the transport chain to be oxidized, its enzyme is found on our second a protein and then that will oxidize it into FADH and some free hydrogen ions. So FADH2s actually pump fewer hydrogens across because they don't utilize the first pump. So if you have more FADH2s than you have NADHs, then you'll produce less ATP. If you have more NADHs than FADH2s, you'll produce more ATP simply because you can use all three. So this is why we kind of get a range of ATPs that can be released, okay? So from ATP synthase, after each of our electron shuttles have been oxidized, you get a range of 26 to 34 ATP. And it can be more or less than that. It just depends on the rate of pumping. Um, but 
it, it'll be a range depending on how many FAD, your ratio of NADHs to FADH2s. Um, the reason it can be variable is these molecules, they can't actually go into the mitochondria. They're too large. So what ends up happening is this shuttle will approach the mitochondrial membrane and there's going to be another, it could either be NAD or an FADH right here. And the electrons will actually get transferred from one shuttle to a different shuttle. So if I start with an NADH and then I transfer my electrons to an FADH2, I've lost out on some energy that I could have had. So it's possible that all, all four of these can transfer their electrons to FADHs instead of NADHs. So we kind of get this range of ATP that could be generated. Cool. Um, so let's kind of look at our yield, everything we get. Let's go back to this guy. Zoom out. So from glycolysis, let's first start where it occurs. So glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. Right? So if we're talking about evolution, um, bacteria, prokaryotes, archaea, all these organisms can do glycolysis. Because glycolysis doesn't require an organelle, um, all forms of life can do glycolysis, right? You only yield, so let's just talk about our complete yield from this, to ATP, right? So not much energy, uh, but you also get the two electron shuttles, okay? So glucose went in, pyruvate came out. Uh, for the Krebs cycle, it occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria, Kind of focus on our yield what do we get out of that um so just from the krebs cycle remember we get four carbon dioxides we got uh two nope sorry six nadhs two fadh2s and two atp cool um, typically, the link reaction will get kind of combined with one of these. So remember the link reaction, the reaction between our two steps, we yielded two carbon dioxides from that one as well, two NADHs as well. Okay, so don't forget about that guy. Um, and then our last step, oxidative phosphorylation, it occurs across the inner membrane. So we're using both spaces, the matrix and the inner membrane space. Um, and then this will yield, um, we end up with 26 to 34 ATP, okay? So every piece of matter that went in came out in the form of water. Um, oh yeah, we also got water. 6H2O. Uh, so the C6H12O6, the O2, the O2 comes out as water, um, the carbon comes out as carbon dioxide, and then the free hydrogens will come out as um, in the water, but then they can also stay and be used to pump and create ATP. So if you look at our net yield of ATP, let's write net. from one glucose molecule, we'll get a range of 26, 28, 30, 34, 36, 38 ATP. So we'll kind of get anywhere from 30 to 38 molecules of ATP, okay? Um, and then all that ATP will be used to power mechanical processes, chemical processes, et cetera, transport processes. So remember, it's the sequential breakdown of glucose, and then we're just releasing those electrons like two pairs at a time, um, and then we're releasing free energy and creating ATP. The other process, so in the absence of oxygen, what our bodies do, and you've experienced this when we did the muscle fatigue lab or when you had to do jumping jacks on like the first week of physio, is in the absence of oxygen, our bodies don't go past pyruvate. 
So if your body detects that there is no oxygen or really low levels of oxygen, then those cells will simply do glycolysis. And then after they've done pyruvate, or after they've created pyruvate, what they'll do is they'll run a process called fermentation. And the reason is we have glucose coming into our bodies, but we just don't have the oxygen to accept our final electrons. So we don't really have a way to keep these electrons moving through our electron transport chain. So what our bodies end up doing is like, well, I'll just convert to pyruvate. I still get two ATP, so I can still keep doing some um, energetic functions, but now I need a way of like taking that pyruvate and either converting it back to glucose or converting it into something else uh, so I can continue making these electron shuttles. So there's two types of fermentation. The one that our bodies do is lactic acid fermentation. Where the pyruvate is converted to lactic acid. Um, and then we do get some electron shuttles from this. Uh, keep in mind, they're kind of useless in the absence of oxygen, but they can be stored until oxygen gets present again due to increased respiration rate. Uh, some other organisms, a lot of yeasts, do alcohol fermentation. Okay. So alcohol fermentation takes pyruvate, and then it will convert it into alcohol. It converts into ethanol. Okay. So when you think about all the alcohols present, like beers, wines, uh, spirits, stuff like that, you have to have a source of glucose. Typically it's a fruit or it's a starch. So like corn or sugar cane or hops. And then they expose that glucose to microbes. So it could be yeasts um, or it could be bacterium. And then those bacteria will take that glucose and ferment it. And then they produce ethanol as a byproduct. So you're getting this production of alcohol due to the glycolysis fermentation of these microbes. Um, this is also what happens in breads. So if you think about sourdough, the way you make sourdough is you take flour, right? Which is a starch. So it's just a lot of glucose is bound together. And then that flour gets exposed to microbes in the atmosphere. And then those microbes will start fermenting and they create these little pockets of um, like sour gas. Okay, which is like carbon dioxide that they're giving off. Um, and then like certain bread starters can become too alcoholic. So you kind of have to like release the alcohols and stuff like that. So interesting. Um, last type of respiration. And we're just going to kind of make a note of it over here. We're not going to draw it. So remember I told you up here, there's two types. So when we say cell respiration, we typically are just referring to... Um, aerobic respiration. So for anaerobic respiration, it also yields like 30 to 38 ATP. Okay, so let's just make a note. It also yields 30 to 38 ATP. So I think there's a misconception that anaerobic respiration is less efficient. It's not. It's just an alternate pathway for organisms that do not live in areas with oxygen. So what anaerobic respiration is, is the organisms still do glycolysis and they still do Krebs and they still do oxidative phosphorylation. So these anaerobic organisms have all the same steps. The only thing that is different is the oxygen. Instead of using oxygen as the final electron acceptor, they just use a different molecule as their final electron acceptor, which typically means that instead of releasing water, right, because we had H2O, they release a molecule like H2S, hydrogen sulfide, where you'll get this like sulfuric uh, fragrance to these like bodies of water that have low oxygen, so the microbes are doing anaerobic respiration. So we also yield 30 to 38 ATP. The only difference between the two is anaerobic molecules, or sorry, organisms, will use a molecule other than oxygen as the final electron acceptor.
once again, is typically sulfur. Um, and so then they'll release H2S into their environments, but they're still um, really efficient with their energy me metabolism. All right, so those are essentially our different types. Um, one kind of thing I wanted to review. So oxidative phosphorylation, we're phosphorylating, right? So we're adding this phosphate group to ADP by oxidizing, taking the electrons from these uh, electron shuttles. So we're oxidizing shuttles to phosphorylate ADP. In photosynthesis, the same thing's happening here. We're phosphorylating ADP, except we're not doing that by oxidizing uh, shuttles. We're doing that by utilizing light energy. So essentially this light energy is what is powering this pumping, and then we can have this diffusion, which allows the phosphorylation of ADP and phosphate. So in cell respiration, it's called oxidative phosphorylation. In photosynthesis, it's referred to as photophosphorylation. I just wanted to add that because I forgot to tell you. It was a long word. So we are, that's the photophosphorylation. So we are phosphorylating ADP utilizing the light energy to pump the hydrogens. So when you're trying to figure out like, is this photophosphorylation or oxidative phosphorylation? What is the cause of the pumping of hydrogen ions? The sunlight energy caused these ions to move. The oxidation of these NADHs caused the hydrogens to move. So we have oxidative versus photo. Okay, I think that's it. Um, so finish up that worksheet. And then you will have a quiz on Friday. It'll be on the last one before spring break. Um, and then I will see you guys back here after spring break. I think we come back to school Tuesday because I think we have Monday off, quote unquote. Uh, but I don't know. I will check. All right. Miss you guys terribly. Talk to you later. Bye.